Okay, let's go. I'm Justin. I'm a Skullcom librarian. My pronouns are he and they. I'm Sadie. I work IT at a public library, and my pronouns are they, them. I'm Jay. I'm a music library director, and my pronouns are he, him. And now, <laughs> Library Punk is proud to introduce the top bookeroo with the five-star review, the man who's shot makes the world hot, Taekwondo Grandmaster, and the world's greatest author, Dr. Chuck Tingle! Oh, yeah. Heck yeah. Incredible. Ah! What an introduction. <laughs> I'm truly honored by that introduction. Wow, what a <laughs> treat you. that was. We've um, been so hyped for you to come on, so. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it was for <laughs> us. <laughs> Very fine. No, I I felt like, um, you know, when I do my book tours, I think buckaroos are used to authors being uh, maybe quiet and reserved. Though, uh, you know, being an author, being a novelist is a, you know, a pretty solitary, quiet activity. And book signings can sometimes have that vibe. But I, I come puffing out of the sacks and do a couple of laps generally. So I think playing that song is pretty fitting for, for my live introductions as well. Yeah, I, I listened to, as prep, I listened to all of my friend Chuck. Wow, and that, that, we did a lot of episodes. Yeah, about like 25. I just had it running to catch up on all my, my Tingle lore, Tingleverse lore. But no, we're just super excited. Um, I guess we have to to explain. Well, actually, just a few episodes ago, we said we talked about your, your story with the Texas Library Association. And I said, well, I, I guess I have to talk about it. And then we, we said, you know, there is still an open invitation for, for Dr. Chuck Tingle to come on the podcast. So I'm glad it, uh, we made it happen. Yeah, I, yes. I'm, I mean, this is, this is an honor to be here. Also, I think yeah, it's it's been a little bit things happen fast in the Tingleverse. You know, that that whole thing happened to uh, gosh, I mean, part of this year, it's only been a little over a month and it in and it seems like being history now. And this is the first time that I have trodden anywhere kind of specifically talking about it. I know we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff, but mm. since uh, since you are in Texas and, you know, this is a librarian show, you know, we can get it and we can get into it. Yeah, absolutely. You, you've you done a whole post on the the specifics of, of what happened, and I have my own theories about why it happened. Oh, um, I'm I'm. I don't know if that's too uh, inside baseball for the listeners, <laughs> but I am I am very curious. I will say, well, who who would you say is a listener? Is it other librarians listening? I mean, is it all kinds of book lovers? What what is, what would you say your listeners are? Gay children. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's like gay. By gay children, we mean librarians and other types of library workers. We have a lot of people who are in library school, so people who are going okay. to be librarians, people who are thinking about becoming librarians. Um, oh, that's great. That's yeah. perfect. That means it's not really uh, inside baseball. That means we can talk about library theory and the audience will go wild. Oh, yeah. yeah they'll love it. Oh, yeah. Well, so what? I, I don't know if it is it is it too is it too deep to ask and what what do you think happened? I don't know. Should should I should I give a a quick rundown? For sure, the go ahead. Can know? All right, this yeah, is, just to set the I, stage. I tend to ramble, but I'm going to try to keep this. Quick. So do we. I'm at, this is going to be a <laughs> summary like no other. Um, I was invited to be a you know it was a guest at the the. Texas Library Association big conference and and kind of a main guest. I don't know how you quantify it, but I was going to speak at the big, big dinner. And there were some back and forths with my publisher where they, you know, they invited. And then a few months later said, uh, well, Chuck uh, can't, can't wear his mask. And my publisher said, that's uh, absurd. He has only appeared anywhere with his mask. Uh, and why did you invite him if you didn't want the mask? 
And then they said, well, he can trot around with his mask, but not not in the main conference. And then the publisher said, well, then the point of the mask is, uh, one, I want to protect privacy. I mean, I'm pretty political. And uh, the amount of death threats that I get, I mean, pretty much one, one a week, maybe more. And so there's that. But second of all, it is... Austin, you know, part of my expression as a brewer on the spectrum, I have learned over time as well that honestly, this is in its in a very interesting way part of my gender expression as well. And so th- there's just a lot of things that I don't necessarily think um, libraries should be policing about the way that uh, buckaroos choose to express themselves in a sincere and important way. And, you know, the publisher actually did write back. The Texas Library Association said, well, we rescind our invitation. Chuck is no longer invited. And uh, when that happened, my publisher did send back a thing that said, you know, there is an important reason that Chuck wears this. I don't know what the exact words are, but they said, you know, this is not some sort of a, a gag or a bit. Chuck needs this to appear. This is an aid for him to which they said we don't uh, really care and then and then i made my post so that that's pretty much the rundown of what happened and i was a uh, bang from uh, the conference uh, as it I, I i you know technically i guess i could go i would say if i want to present myself in a way that feels comfortable and uh, physically express my neurodivergence and gender and all that um, i am not allowed so that's where it is. Yeah, and I, I remember that they eventually they did resend. They the, resend uh, their, inv- their yes, they resended <laughs> it. And then after after the, I posted this, there was a big uh, big uh, pushback. I think a lot of buckaroos were pretty upset. And then and then uh, they said, "Oh, oops, uh, Chuck, can you can come again?" And um, honestly. You know, I guess I appreciate uh, Buckaroos trying to to make some sort of effort, although the the apology was a little uh, lackluster, I would say. Mm -hmm. But um, I also decided, you know, as someone with specific needs to present myself, I cannot imagine them actually taking care of me and it being a safe environment for me if they won't even do the bare minimum of just kind of letting me exist in my own skin. You know, there are things, especially with my way on autism spectrum of, um, I actually honestly just, I think even neurotypical buds probably get this of I'm overwhelmed by crowds. And sometimes I just, I just got to get out of there. I only travel with my uh, buckaroo uh, who can kind of like help me get, get away from things and, and, and helps me a lot. And so I always have a guide and um, I can't imagine them accommodating that. So I just thought I don't really feel safe with these buckaroos. Mm. That's actually a huge like discussion around library conferences, especially since the pandemic, when a lot of them did move online for a little bit. A lot of librarians who do a lot of disability advocacy started talking about, wait, we've been able to make them virtual this entire time, like, or yes. hybrid this entire time. Why haven't we been doing that? Because, like, I love going to an in person conference. I love being around a lot of people. I love that kind of thing. But I understand that, like, not everybody does. And especially in librarianship, it tends to attract a certain kind of pe- person sometimes, right? Oh, um, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, I think, um, is it Jess Schomburg is one of, and we've, we've had them on the podcast before. They've talked a lot about like the sort of like library conferences, having the ability to be hybrid or completely virtual, like is an accessibility issue. It's a disability yeah. issue, like accommodating the fact that people had these different needs with how they show up in public or interact with other people is important. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that conversation's happening. I'm, I was, you know, the whole thing was pretty shocking to me mm-hmm. um, and just because it seems, you know, maybe I'm in my own little bubble. It just seems so obvious that if someone has this, they need to, to physically present that, you know, a library of all places would be accommodating. I think, um, you know, I, I, I have an interesting relationship with my autism because my whole life, it has kind of only been a positive thing for me. I really like it. I think it's very cool to be autistic, actually, and it's been that way ever since I was diagnosed. I have never seen it as a disability, but I also recognize that it kind of needs to be because it is a spectrum. 
and that there are some buckaroos with this diagnosis who do need help, who need additional help. And so in this conversation, you know, I, it made me uncomfortable that I had to actually say what this mask is, which is that technically speaking, this is a disability aid. It it even makes me uncomfortable saying it because like I said, I just don't, I don't, when I talk about my autism, that is not the focus. It's just kind of something that needs to be addressed because of your government funding for program. I'm taking care of buckaroos, you know, who are functioning in a different way than I am and stuff. So to be thrust into this situation where I had to have that conversation about my neurodivergence very publicly because the Texas Library Association, I don't really know why, but because they had a problem with, with my disability, I think is uh, really sad. And kind of the most insidious part of all this is that when you gatekeep like that, when you discriminate like that, whatever this was, you're not just kind of not allowing someone to go to your reference. It's not just one thing. It's putting all of the effort and all of the work that has to be done onto this buckaroo, in this case myself, that didn't really want to have this conversation and to talk about this as a disability aid. I think ultimately it's a good thing because it is a a good conversation to have. But, uh, you know, I think it would have been better if I could have that conversation in my own time, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'm really glad that you've come on to talk about it because this will be recorded for, you know, we do have a lot of people who can help run these conferences, people who aren't just at the student level, but, you know, I've helped run conferences um, and, you know, to so that they can realize that they need to front load this labor and not dump it on the attendees, which was my theory, because there's there's a lot going on with book bans right now. And, you know, certain state agencies have to, like, leave the American Library Association. And there was some like, oh, is this an agenda against Chuck? And my theory is actually it was just incompetence by the conference leaders was they just didn't realize, oh, we have to work to make something accessible for people. And we're going to to invite someone and not even think for one second about what they need as a as an invited guest is such a like it's so unbelievably rude is the yes. thing about this. Well let me so I've obviously thought about this a lot. Um let me I'm not gonna say push back on your theory, but here's 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 where the discussion is that that as well. That's kind of generally what what I would first go to. But the thing that's confusing to me is that it's not that it's a lot of work for the the person who is banned and has to kind of talk about their their autism and all this stuff. Um, what they were asked to do is so bare minimum, no effort. That I feel like when in in my mind, when I thought of the theory that you just brought up, it falls apart for me because I think, what did they actually have to do other than rent of someone's appearance, I guess? I, I mean, th- there, there's no additional stuff. I have someone that comes with me if I, if I need help with anything. So I don't know. It, I, that's where I get stuck. No, totally. It's the thing is, I have never been involved with this conference or the Texas Library Association. I'm I'm not from Texas originally. I've only lived here five years and I just the state level stuff wasn't really interesting for me. So I don't really get involved with with that particular conference. So I couldn't tell you who in particular was running it, but it just the the banality of just like, oh, we had this rule, right? There's this rule about masks, right? And then just putting it out there so callously well, that you just... Well, it's interesting. Yeah. They didn't even say there was a rule. They, uh, yeah. they just said we... And they didn't say that someone w- was uncomfortable. They said they were worried that someone might be uncomfortable with the way that I look. Mm. So... Mm-hmm. I just, it, it is kind of mind blowing. I, you know, the, the really obvious one is to say, oh, well, you know, it's, they're just being discriminatory. It's run by a bunch of being conservatives or something. But, um, I, you know, if you look at the other in people invited, my bud uh, TJ Plume was invited, you know, queer. Um, I think George Takai is one of the Buckaroos, one of the guests. So, and and in previous years they had had um, you know drag queens and all kinds of stuff 
Now, I know that there's some politics with the ALA and maybe leadership changes or something like that. But, you know, it, that seems kind of strange to me, too. What I came to and what I wrote was almost a a left side thing. And, and it's interesting. This is a great podcast for this since, uh, you know, we're kind of talking about library politics and all this stuff. I think the most intricate one, but the one that actually I can't, it doesn't have any obvious holes to poke in it, is not the far right idea. It is the far left idea that I, and I I encounter this sometimes where because my presentation is so unusual, because what I write is, is, and I use unusual, not disparaging, just literally uncommon, that sometimes very far left bookers who have never heard of me or have heard of me from 10 years ago think that I am some kind of a, you know, ironic message board, like 4chan <laughs> thing. <laughs> that is homophobic or like a parody or I, I don't really know entirely, but I, every once in a while, there'll be someone kind of very heroically making some posts saying, you know, Chuck Tingle's a, a bad guy. He, he writes about being a uh, buckaroos paneled in dinosaurs and big feet and obviously making fun of queer people. I'm obviously not really queer, not really neurodivergent, that kind of thing. Ironically, just seeing someone and, and kind of gatekeeping them and saying that is the wrong way to be queer, that is the wrong way to be autistic, is in itself the, about the most homophobic and bigoted thing these, quote, left, left-wing left people could do. But it does happen. And when I thought about it with this conference, I thought, gosh, I wonder if that is it. Because it is a very, you know... Like I said, they they have a lot of queer buckaroos. They have kind of, um, you know, we've had drag queens in the past. I thought, what if someone booked Chuck and then someone high up kind of looked at my catalog and thought, oh, this is obviously a joke. Mm. Um, that was maybe my theory. And I don't know if it's any more likely than the other ones, but it's the one theory that I kind of can't uh, poke a hole in. And, mm. you know. Yeah. And it. It, it, it relates a lot to, like, I'm glad you brought up the idea of comfort and people being uncomfortable, right? Because I feel like this is also another thing in a lot of spaces, but in libraries, like the idea of like, what should be allowed in a library based on what makes certain groups of people uncomfortable. Like, a lot of people get angry about homeless buckaroos using public libraries because people get uncomfortable around oh, homeless yes. people. Okay, and it's like, you are going to be uncomfortable when you are out in public sometimes. And I feel like people are having a hard time grasping that. Um, yes. Yes. Yeah, Finding like that's, that yeah. Yes. yeah. Interesting. That discomfort yeah. is not automatically a bad, a thing. bad thing or a harm or yeah. anything against people. Yeah. Yes. So. Right. I mean, libraries are kind of, and what, what, why they're so important to me is it is kind of a, a last public meeting space. You know, mm -hmm. funded by the public. Uh, it, it's, it's like this, this revere. It's so interesting that of all the kind of public services and things that, you know, tax, tax dollars go to, even more than like park, like city parks or anything, but the library is such a, like a town hall where they say, okay, we're going to have all these voices. Anyone can come here and we are going to be a place of ideas is such a beautiful thing. And I think emotionally, why maybe the Texas Library Association thing affected me uh, more than I expected was because I thought, wow, this felt like the last, last thing. You know, it felt like this, these are the buckboards who are standing up for that space. And then to see it crumble like that was, was pretty devastating. I, I obviously I don't think this is all libraries. It's just some particular buckaroos in the Texas Library Association. But it is interesting. Yeah, it's it's very disappointing, and I'm very sad that it happened. And wish I had been at least able to voice my displeasure directly to the people involved. If I had, it would have been nice to yes. to yell. <laughs> <laughs> get myself thrown off of the organizing committee or something. Um, well, I, you know, I'm actually kind of curious because, you know, there are buckaroos that know what 
happen. And behind the scenes, I'm actually kind of surprised that no one has posted something. Uh, right. Maybe someday, but you know, these are large organizations, you know, these are, and not everyone's going to agree. So I, it, I think the one thing that has been kind of surprising is that um, there has not been any more information. Yeah. Especially with how sparse that apology was. Like you say that it was lackluster and I'm just like that not even I, I would go lower <laughs> than lackluster if I could think of the word for it because it just wasn't really anything at all. Yeah, I think technically but, yeah. speaking, it, it, I, I think calling it apology is generous on my I think technically yeah, speaking, I'm, I'm not saving even their sure ass is if better. it was an yeah. apology so much, but um, you know, trying to trying to take the high ground trot here. <laughs> <laughs> I am curious though for this event. I mean, did you already have planned out what you were going to talk about? You know, I think so. Uh, that seemed like more of a Q and A. So uh, mm-hmm. no, I I did I did not. In fact. I generally kind of don't like to, I don't like to know what, what questions are going to be. I know, you, I, you know, most podcasts, or at least most professional ones, like ourselves, you know, will send kind of the question list or, or things like that. I, I don't ever read them intentionally. I just, I kind of don't, don't like to know. Um, Neither do most of our guests. It's fine. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. It's um, for us more than anybody else. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes I feel bad because I know effort goes into them, but I do genuinely think my answers will be better if I if I don't know. I, I also think it's very kind of you. Speaking of like, accessibility, I think that there are some buckaroos who very much appreciate and kind of want to to plan. So it's a good thing to do, but it's just kind of just the opposite of the way my brain works. I, I like to just let her rip yeah absolutely i mean that is one of the reasons but it's also to keep us on track because all of us have have add so if there wasn't like a bullet point list it would be really hard to get through everything we wanted to it's hard even sometimes just to bring ourselves in it's always fun to like be watching the notes while the podcast is happening because justin will like move things around and erase things based on what we've talked about Well, what note are what note are we at? Hit One. Me well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> start the interview. <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, we're on, we're on the two now. We're on the we're on the second bullet point. Okay, Woo. we're good. We're good. <laughs> you've you've done these library conferences before, right? What can what can they do better? I mean, we already talked about the the load on putting the load on to someone else, but you know, I mean, is well, is is planning too much in a, ahead? Is that a problem? Is it like too rude? Is it like do you need this? Do you need that? Does that get patronizing at a point? I have actually not done a library conference before, um, so I don't know if I can. I I do. I mean. I love book tour stuff. And so I, you know, have done a lot of um, kind of bookstore. I do presentations. I've done a lot of, I mean, I've gone to, to did a panel at Comic Con for probably the last thing, seven years. So I'm in San Diego Comic Con every year and have done a bunch of conventions. But I have not done a library association conference, you know, without saying too much after Texas Library Association, you know, did what they did. I think that I might uh, appear at possibly some other state conferences this year. Maybe. Wink, wink. But uh, <laughs> that's kind of getting worked out. But no, I, I have actually, I wish I could answer that better. But um, no, I don't, I don't really know. I'm excited to learn. Yeah. Well, we'll just have to bring you back on once you've done your tour of all, all 50 library associations or 49. Yes. Um, yeah, 49. <laughs> yes, I'm not allowed at one. <laughs> Banned for life. When you started doing like your book tours, stuff i mean did you was there anything you learned that you needed while you were doing book tour talks after you started writing interesting um i think what i learned was that um i I am a very different i am a very different person than most authors like i kind of said at the beginning there is a, a a book book tour is like generally a pretty quiet affair and you know, when I'm on tour, it's it's a show. It's a pretty big show. We got a projector. And everyone's running around. I kind of get off stage, fighting like then Elvis Presley under the hot blaring <laughs> lights. Uh, so uh, you know, it is uh, it's just kind of a whole uh, it's a whole different thing. And I knew that going in. 
But I think I definitely learned, especially on the last book tour, doing Q and A's, where I would have a bud from the city kind of come, and we would we would chat, and that's always wonderful. I just love that part of it. I do love a deep discussion. But when I started then, you know, running around doing laps and and all that to cough in the microphone, then I always think my Q and A partners must be thinking, "Oh my gosh, what I think." What did I sign up for? <laughs> I wish more I, authors would like that. My like least favorite part of most library conferences I've been to is when they get some celebrity or author as the keynote, and I like you get a bingo card out because that they, they say the same thing every time, yeah. which is how much their public library as a kid was so important to them, and they wouldn't be the author they were today without it. It's like I could do it in my sleep now. It's like no, you're actually interesting. <laughs> I, yeah, well, you know. I, I guess we'll never know what I would say to uh, <laughs> to the Texas Library Association, but no, I, I like to get out the slides and uh, yeah. and kind of I play some games. Generally, it is really a fun time. I think honestly, I think because of the styles, this next book tour will probably do more off-site things because uh, it was a little too big for bookstores. So, you know, I think it'll end up being more in theaters, which is even more like a, a dang show. Which in itself, even talking about this, you know, I'm I'm not the biggest author ever. I'm not being James Patterson, but um, interestingly, Buckaroos uh, are trying to uh, really like to trot out and and see me in person, which I think is really it's just really fun. I get so much energy. It's like I, I think every day and night I'm crying tears of joy by the end. I mean, it's very emotional. Yeah, no, I feel the same way. Uh, you know, like we just went to a friend's first live show for their podcast. And it was a, a wild time, you know, it was, it was done in a, in a bar theater thing and we all had fun. We went out for drinks afterwards and it was, you know, just a, a great fun time. I don't understand why more things can't just be allowed to be fun. They have to. Yes. Even other podcasts, I feel like there are some where it was clearly a conversation that happened and then they went back and re-edited their questions in so they sound more formal. And I was oh, like, wow. why Why would you do that? Why wouldn't you just enjoy the conversation and have fun? We're, we're here to prove love and have fun. And That's I mean, right. You know, let's... Dang let's right. Just, but they trot. I actually, so, and uh, you know, my, my appearance is also, I, I never do live readings too, which is, uh, I'm kind of another change as I, you know, so that makes the energy up too, because um, if we're doing kind of games and discussions and such as instead of live readings, you know, I don't know how authors do. I guess that's what buckwings are there for, but that seems like a tall order to to hold an audience just by reading reading a book. But you know, buckwings like it. It's been that way been that way for decades. But uh, yes, that's not really the trend. Yeah, not going to go full Charles Dickens, making your living off of live readings. No, no, I'm maybe more. Maybe more than Bob Barker making my living off of a live game show host. <laughs> nice. I would watch it. Yeah. Same. All right. We're, so we're starting a petition. Chuck Dingle hosts Jeopardy. Yes. Um. yes. <laughs> Bring me to your dang library's uh, game night. I'm going to blow the roof oh, off yeah. of that place. <laughs> yes. Heck yeah. Uh, the moment I get you c- control over the budget. I'm going to have to like get involved more with the Massachusetts Library Association just so I can make this happen. Do it. Or the Music Library Association since I'm in that one. Oh, you'd be a hit at the Music Library Association conference. Heck yeah. Heck yeah. Oh yeah, heck yeah. I am curious because Sadie and Jay both have written erotica and I wanted to know when what made you start and did you have a moment where it was like, all right, this just needs to get out there? Yes. Uh, so I think, you know, erotica specifically, I, I do tend to like art that um, dabbles in, in the taboos. That's probably why I like horror is, you know, you have, you have the tab violence and then and violation. And then erotica is just the taboo of sex and, and sexuality. So I, I artistically, I, I've always found those interesting. I think kind of exploring sexuality has always been interest of mine with art. And it kind of, I think, is coupled with my artistic philosophy that, um, you know, I just like art that pushes the boundaries of the format. A book that is more than just the text on, on the book a song that is more than just the time that you listen to it. So I'm generally interested in what's outside the formal piece and and how that art 
connects to it. It's a sort of a Dadaist philosophy, although that, funny enough, very punk, also kind of cynical. And I don't think there's anything cynical about what I do. But I think my interest in all of that philosophically really made me interested in sexual art because there is all this baggage that comes along with it outside of the art that is very interesting to play with. I remember, you know, being a dang young buckaroo and kind of learning about or seeing the Supreme Court obscenity cases. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think it was Larry Flint, actually, and, and Hustler. But, um, but basically, just the idea of the Supreme Court saying, well, pornography is defined by something that has no artistic value. And the second that I heard that, I realized, oh, then pornography just doesn't exist because there is literally nothing with no artistic value. That, that is, that's absurd. That just can't, can't happen. Everything, every creation has some artistic value when the Supreme Court can't just say, well, sorry, there was no art there. And so I remember getting really riled up about that and thinking, gosh, that's so interesting and kind of um, wanting to kind of explore sexuality and art and stuff because of that very, very early on in, in life and thinking that was so interesting. So I think it probably comes from there in some ways as well. No, it's fascinating. I've also heard you talk about the holistic nature of, of how you perceive art, you know, living your life yes. as well. Yes. I, I mean, I think it is the interaction of the, of the artist and, and the, uh, and the audience. I think, you know, it's, I'm, it's interesting how controversial this is. It's been debated forever about can you separate the art from the artist? And it is, it is actually my belief that that's not possible to do by simply because I don't think that art ends with the, the piece as we see it. So no matter what, uh, you know, your view of a painting is going to be framed not just by the physical frame, but by what you know about the artist. Not only that, what you don't know about the artist. I think a lot of the times the argument against that is, Marker, say, well, what about a painting that I have no, I just have seen it for the first time. I believe that not knowing anything of artists also informs it. Um, yep. So it, it is really literally impossible. And and I also think that that's okay. You know, it's up to each buckaroo to decide how much of that they are going to participate on. What's a, what's a bridge too far for them? What's, what's a bridge not, but just pretending that, that, that you can do the separation. I think what it does is it makes it so the buckaroo saying that can then feel absolved. As if they are now not responsible for their actions in, in participating in these things. When in reality, I think that we kind of need to own it and also say that sometimes, some, sometimes it's okay to, uh, to read a book by someone who has done bad things. It's all up to the, the person reading it and how much and what it was. I mean, a great example for me is, you know, I love the Beatles. I listen to them all the time. I don't know if a lot of buckaroos know this. John Lennon, not a very good uh, buckaroo, you know? And I think about that and I think, well, I have to wait. He's uh, not alive. He also actually addressed the fact that he was not a good buckaroo. And most of his career is about him trying to change that. But without anyone calling on it, he kind of did it himself. There's all these things I can go through. And I can think about, say, J.K. Rowling and think, I don't like what she has to say. All these different things. I weigh it. She's still alive. I'm not going to buy any sort of Harry Potter, you know, books or whatever. But that's a, that's a choice that I am going to make. And other buckaroos can make their choice of whether they want to, you know, have me at their thing because I don't buy, you know, I don't buy JK Rowling books, but I still buy Beatles records, you know. If someone has a problem with that, that's fine too. The whole point is, is that pretending that we are in some sort of a vacuum where art and the reality of who made it are fundamentally disconnected. The only thing that does is let gives people an excuse so they can feel better about participating with these things. When what I do is when I listen to a Beatles record, I know that my opinion of that song is going to be colored by what I know about John Lennon. I'm not going to say that's going to make it better or worse. It's going to make it different. And to pretend it won't is not really something that I'm interested in. Sorry, that was probably the most rambling answer you've ever gotten on this thing podcast. 
I, I apologize. <laughs> no. it's, it's really not. <laughs> well, I, I, went, um, I went on for that one. I apologize. No, it was it was great, and like I, I'm so glad that you also brought up like the obscenity cases and them arguing that like well, pornography doesn't have artistic merit because, and this kind of also relates to the like you know, when do you decide to read or something, and like there's a discussion right now in libraries about like whether or not particularly public libraries should have quote pornography in them Very because. A lot of wow. yeah, because yeah. a lot of conservatives are like, well, we have to ban these books about queer people because that's pornography because it talks about, and then they just can't say anymore. It's just oh, yeah. well, it's porn because we say it is, and then you get a lot of librarians who think they're helping by going. Libraries don't have porn books that talk about queer sex aren't porn and all that, and I'm like, no, that's not the way you should address that yeah, argument. It it's in, that's very interesting. It is two separate issues. You hear. You hear a yeah. lot about some conservatives kind of saying that these queer books are inherently porn, but you are right. There's a bigger conversation, which is that adults use libraries. You know, is it, why why is that not a place where where pornography would be available? There's a big philosophical question. Or so interesting. Well, yes. and, <laughs> and and like I when I think about this, is like my thing is just like having worked the front desk at a public library, like I checked out so many romance novels to so many people. And it's like, what's really the difference there between that and like Playboy? It's a it's a matter of medium, right? These are written words. So you assume that they're safer somehow than like a Playboy magazine where you can see like a woman scantily clad or whatever. But yes. like, and then, then you factor in eBooks and how like the number one thing that public libraries check out is romance and erotica, right? Yeah. Because that's, because it's more private that way, right? You, there's less, le there's, you know, your neighbors aren't going to see you checking out, you know, like the, the best erotica of 2023, which like is the kind of thing that my old library that I worked at had. And so it was just like, it, 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 are we really concerned with like porn here or are we concerned with how visible sexuality is? And yeah. that just circles right back to, you know, conservatives and what they believe is acceptable versus what is. And then part of obscenity too is always it's the community's standards or I forget exactly how it's phrased, but there's part of that too when they weigh obs what obscenity is, is what the community standards are for that. So it could vary quite wildly and yeah, yeah. no it's it's Are a really weird time for libraries right now i think but yeah jay is 100 percent correct in, in why why don't we have porn in libraries and uh, i guess if we did I how do we do that in a way that works yeah instead of just writing it off the table so that answers my question which is um are there libraries be because I know, I, you know, erotica is about in, for written word as much as, as, you know, that is the closest equating to um, like visual porn that most would, would think of. But libraries also have video, DVD rentals, downloads. Are there any libraries with, I guess, what the majority would, would call, you know, traditional gonzo pornography in their video archive? If, does that exist in any libraries? It depends. It's more common in academic libraries because of like women's studies courses. Oh, yes. Um, but also there are some more sort of like specialized libraries. Like, for example, back at the end of January, uh, when Justin and I went to the, the live show, we also went to the Leather Archives and Museum in Chicago, which does have a library inside of it. And it's just pouring in there. Um, yes. <laughs> um, and there's a, another library in Chicago that I actually volunteered at when I was in grad school called the Gerber Hart. And it's a queer library and archives. And some of the DVDs that I cataloged were pornography. And that was a thing that circulates in that library. Like when people say, oh, there's not porn in libraries. I'm like, no, there is. I know because I cataloged it. Yes. Um, <laughs> so yeah. it, it, it just depends on the type of library usually. Do you know that a library should be a trove of information and uh, an expression of existence as human beings and then not contain something that is pretty a big part of most humans in, you know existence is such an interesting kind of relic of mm -hmm. you know i guess you could say religion or, or conservatism or, or things where it, it is very fascinating you know even you saying that i'm thinking you know i have tinglers that are references to or written about big events 
you know, you can go back in, in chronological order, look at my Tingler shorts. And really, it's like reading history for the last eight years because there, there are different political events or yes. different things. But also that happens with, you know, visual pornography, where it really makes the new, you know, the Era Palin parody from back in, in that election. And say, I'm just thinking of these things where there was a big news item that was based around a piece of visual pornography and the idea that that is somehow not historically relevant, whatever you think of it, even ethically, even if you said, I don't like any of that on ethical bounds or the creation or the industry, I think denying that it has historical context is pretty silly, actually, when you really think about all these events. It is silly. It is. Yeah. So I, I was really curious to ask if there is kind of anything in particular that you love about writing erotica. Like it's what your catalog is probably mostly known for at this point in time. So like you've been doing it for a long time. Like what, what are your favorite aspects about writing it from wow. the initial creation all the way through people's reactions? Like I find specific to erotica, I find the fact that it, it is generally a genre where th there's a, it's almost like a one beat story. And I just made a pun accidentally. That was not, <laughs> that was not my intention, but uh, I did really mean that. And now I realize that's a great pun. But, um, you know, with, with my horror novels, I am writing, those are very much like three act structure, very much traditional story beats generally of, um, I use film story beats a lot. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. so, you know, I, I can map those out. What I like about erotica as an art form is because they are shorts, it is essentially a single beat, which is the character has a problem. And then you have to figure out how do they solve that problem with set. And so oh. it, it's such an interesting. <laughs> oh, that was great. <laughs> I, finally, the soundboard makes it. <laughs> um, and I just, I, I think that's so interesting that there's an entire genre that just has this structure, especially when you look at, you know, the three act structure is so, you know, that's basically prehistoric. It's, it's just so in, ingrained. And, and then to just kind of have this thing where you say, well, what is it that makes this function as the one being? And honestly, because erotica has this separate goal, it's, it's supposed to arouse, you know, a lot of buckaroos, it's supposed to get them off. And so that, and I've talked about this before, like horror, like comedy, are these interesting genres where you, you have a second goal and not honestly, not even a side goal. It's almost like the beat and then traditional structure is the side goal. And your main goal is either to kind of arouse uh, with erotica, to stare with horror, or to make laugh with comedy. So those genres have always just fascinated me. So mm. I think, yeah, that's my favorite part of writing erotica is just knowing that I'm exploring this really unique genre. I found it so interesting. Yeah, the uh, the Horror Vanguard podcast talks about that relationship between horror, comedy, and erotica uh, oh, good, a lot. Yes. They're they're always saying horror wants to do things to your body. Wow. Um, yes. Yeah, and they and, and they talk about rom coms every once in a while. And they also we are very good friends, and they asked me to give them a good shot out on the podcast right, okay. and i was like perfect slide in but yeah that's something they, they talk about a lot and also i was watching one of your interviews earlier where you talk about with i believe it's camp damascus about how you call it more cathartic horror as opposed to more darker horror like i, I my trot is more on the darker horror side yeah. but it makes complete sense because cathartic horror it has sort of the same goal of like romance or erotica where I know at the end that everything's going to turn out good, yes, yes. either good uh, happily ever after or happily for now or whatever. But how the hell do we get there, right? How do we go through all of these obstacles to get there? And that's what I really like about romance and erotica. And so I was like, oh, this makes complete sense that like cathartic horror kind of maps a little bit onto the same. Yes. kind of structure as romance and erotica although here's one difference that i would say is that mm -hmm. um, i think you have to trust you have to trust the either the author or the director or or whatever who's telling a cathartic horror story 
Because one thing that you did say, the only difference is that I don't think, I don't think that you know, you have to have a thing in the back of your head where you're not quite sure what kind of horror it's going to be. I think yeah. the job of a cathartic horror writer, and, and that's what I would call myself, is to ease the edge of a, of a sort of brutalist kind of hardcore horror and always make the audience think this time it could go with it. Because mm. I actually think that, that the real key to it is not knowing and yeah. then being taken that direction. So it is similar in some ways, but a little different. It's, it's like a roller coaster. It's the, the, the feeling that you're, you know, maybe going to uh, fly off and crash <laughs> and die. But also knowing that, you know, there are safety checks and these different things. So I think that the best catharsis can only work if you actually believe that there are the stakes where it could not go. And so I'm kind of experimenting, you know, I have set up, you know, straight in my first kind of horror novella, very cathartic. I think Camp Damascus is cathartic. I will say there's something coming up, you know, I think what I write is very positive, but um, there are some things crowding that I think could be, uh, could be a lot. We'll see. We'll see. I'm playing around. I'm experimenting. But um, this, yes. This segues into my next question is I was listening to your interview on Talking Scared that you did last year, where you yes. mentioned the, the comedy horror sort of erotica like thing. And like I, there are so many parallels there that are super interesting like there's there's the element of anticipation there's the elements of disgust there is you know so many things crossover things between yes. those three genres but i was kind of curious like what sort of other crossovers between those genres have you discovered in having kind of played between horror and erotica yes. and like or are there any other sort of elements between those that you are are exploring or are hoping to explore in the future yes there's two. One is a timing, obviously, which kind of goes back to the tension and release mm. um, of the way that you get these uh, bodily reactions, whether it's fear, laughter, or arousal, is through peaks and valleys. And peaks and valleys inherently involve time. How much are you going to build that tension? Where are you going to release it? So that's one similarity. I would say the other thing that kind of you wouldn't expect but has been very interesting for me is a uh, I prefer to write high concept ideas. A lot of buckaroos actually kind of misuse that term or don't, don't really know what it means. I would say all my writing is, is pretty high concept, especially my queer horror, which is a high concept for listeners who don't know. Some think that that means like really artsy, elevated, uh, kind of like a difficult to understand thing. High concept is actually the opposite of that. If you talk about a high concept film or something like that, it's essentially something that the concept could sell the movie without an actor or a director attached. It's a one sentence idea that generally has a bit of irony to it. And it's almost like, almost in some ways a joke, even if it's not a comedy. A really obvious high concept example would be the film Liar Liar, which the one sentence pitches um, um, a lawyer can't lie for a day. So that that is like the epitome of high concept of just kind of taking something, flipping it up, flipping it on its head. And so you know, I, I have straight my my horror novella, which is you know that one day a year zombie apocalypse, but it only affects the cisgender straight people. You know, so Camp Damascus, spoilers for anyone who has not read Camp Damascus, skip ahead day 30 seconds, but uh, <laughs> let's say a minute because I do ramble, <laughs> but skip ahead and then go by Camp Damascus. But Camp Damascus is about, you know, the ends justifying the means and in a church instead of removing possessions, invoking possession to, to stop what they perceive as sin. So it's taking these familiar ideas and then kind of in a one sentence kind of twisting them. Yeah. I think that and and erotica and horror are all very good with high concept. I think, you know, a big influence for me is Jordan Peele. And if you look at his work as a comedian on Key and yes. Peele, a lot of those sketches, if you took the idea and, and filmed it a different way, would be horror. You could film them as horror sketches. Um, and a lot and, of romances are like that too. Absolutely. Yes. 
and and then Jordan Peele's movies, you know, if you take what Get Out is about and say, you know, it is it is these kind of old white people kind of stealing black bodies, that is a horror premise. But also, that could have been a sketch on on Key yeah. and Peele, and and so I think when you take those high concept things that goes for those three genres, even pornography, if you really look at, I mean, these days, if you're looking at, uh, you know, the industry of pornography is pretty dang gonzo now, where it is just, buckaroos are just having sex, there's not generally a story behind it. But I think kind of in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, uh, when people think of, it's generally you know, a pretty heightened setup about a dang a nurse or a king's man or a dang firefighter or something. So all of these really high concept ideas work. And I think ultimately what that relates to is all three of them are camp in a way, because I think camp is high concept. So I, I think that that is kind of why queer horror works for me and why, you know, I think a lot of buckers resonate with tinglers as erotica and also some as, uh, as humor. Yeah. I was, we were talking about your, your upcoming appearance in our discord and someone said something and I said, I no tinglers are political commentary. First erotica second. Uh, yes. <laughs> I would say so. I would say that they are, well, you know, what's interesting is when I write them, I, they, I don't know what I do first. I do write message first. That's a very astute observation. I I always want them to function as a piece of erotica. And that is, I would call that the heart of it. But you are correct is that because I am such a message first writer, it is generally the message as commentary and that, that the erotica is the vehicle. And then I honestly, I say this all the time, I really don't write them to be funny. I don't really like, personally, I'm not a big comedy guy, but what I have learned is that I kind of have a naturally funny voice and perspective. So when I write things, even horror kind of ends up being kind of funny and, and tinglers, I can lean into it a lot more and Buckaroos will find it funny. But interestingly, the goal of them really is not to be comedy, which I think is probably one of the most interesting things about it because it is clearly very funny to Buckaroos and that's great. Mm. I mean, sex is funny. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. It is. yeah. <laughs> sex is inherently weird and silly. So like, yeah, run with it. And it's also hot. These things are, they are the same, you know? Yeah. All over. Yeah. Like I loved the way in one of the episodes of my friend Chuck, when you talked about, when you wrote about the like physical man, physical manifestation of washing my hands, that, that one, how you talked about how, you know, with that one, you wanted to talk about it's the importance of washing your hands during the pandemic and like good hygiene, but also like forming habits and trying to take the negative connotation away from habit forming and instead of making it hot lesbian hand washing situation yes. and it was awesome yes. i was like yes this is great yeah like i just i loved the way that you talked about about that about like the messaging and the erotica they're the same thing you yes. can't really separate yes. them yes. yeah yeah i there was another thing you had mentioned somewhere i've just started camp damascus so i just bought it and this is oh, this always you. happens where where i have an author on and i want to get the whole book done but then I just do everything else, like watch all their interviews instead so that I don't ask the same question they've been asked a million times. Okay. No, no worries. <laughs> so I'm I'm just at the part. I'm just after like chapter one. I'm like halfway through chapter two. But you mentioned at one point probably years ago how the terror of God was really like the, the concept of if there is a God and if like how horrifying a concept that can be in and of itself, especially if there is a, you know, a, a Christian God that sends people to hell for being queer. I just bought a book called like the, the horror of God. It's about like Job. And I, I think it also ties in Islam, but is that one of like the main sources of horror for you? Or are you, is it one um, that you fixate you know on? What? I think it is, it's kind of, it is both. Yes, that, but kind of the opposite of that. I've never been a religious buckaroo. Religion has not, um, you know, it's, I, I'm always very flattered by Camp Damascus reviews and stuff because a lot of buckaroos say, oh, 
you know, Chuck must have kind of grown up in the church and all this stuff. Exactly um, what I thought. <laughs> yes. And, uh, and no, not, not at all. I think I kind of about uh, maybe six or seven uh, encountered the idea of, uh, of a kind of a Christian God and thought, I don't know about that. It seems kind of silly. And then didn't really think about it too much anymore. But, you know, in my youth, I, you know, there's a lot about me that is private, but something that I have talked about a little bit is, um, you know, my teenage years and the kind of 20 were spent traveling the country, a little Jack Kerouac style or cruising around, <laughs> kind of not without a home and going all over the place, uh, getting rides and kind of meeting a lot of buckaroos. And I was very close with, and I'm still very close with, some very religious buckaroos. A couple of buckaroos that were raised in cults. One of them, you know, the, you might, the buckaroos have heard of, kind of, you know, one of the big, big cults. And so, actually, I uh, called them up and interviewed them before mm. writing Campus And And also, I think that, you know, coming from a place of... I think because I didn't have that religious upbringing, but had very religious friends at a young age, you know, I would attend their root beer keggers when they were definitely old enough to be having beer, beer, they were still having the root beer keggers. I was at one that the, the police came to break it up and uh, everyone said, uh, tried to give uh, out some uh, ding minor in possessions in the, and were were shocked when the party goers revealed that it was all root beer. Um, <laughs> so you know, I I I had personal experience, and I think a lot of time I talk about writing from a place of love or creating from a place of love, and that can sound pretty abstract. But I like having Camp Damascus to point to, which is that you know, as you're reading, you will see characters in it that are religious characters that a lot of buckaroos resonate that I think another author who wasn't writing from a place of love could have handled in a pretty aggressive way. And I think that because I'm coming at it from a place of love, those characters can really sing and it can kind of bring together some things. And I think what it does is it makes Camp Damascus less of an anti-religion book and more of an anti-using religion for hate book, mm. uh, which is, I think, I think nice. So yeah, that just comes from writing from a place of love. I think my fear generally is kind of the opposite of that, is um, at such an early age to kind of reject the idea of kind of a sentient, omnipresent being the idea of death, the idea of the size of the universe, those are awe-inspiring awe things. They're beautiful things. But when you really think about them, they're also kind of frightening in a lot of ways as well. Yeah, that's that's great. Thank you for letting me know. I, I do love religious horror. There's always some I, I go back to. But I want to make sure that you have enough time to talk about your upcoming book, Barrier Gaze. So is there a I'll pitch get. that you have and you would like to share with the listeners? Let's see. I think that um, if you like cathartic horror and i'm not going to give away the ending because i will say that there's you know not everything goes right in this book but i do think it's a very cathartic read i think that it is very it's kind of a love letter to fandom i think i think that it's a love letter to kind of human creation i know that we are living in an increasingly automated time i think that it's a it's also Interestingly, because uh, through writing tinglers, I've gotten very close to a lot of um, asexual buckaroos by writing asexual tinglers, tinglers without any any sex that kind of follow the erotica formula. So I have a lot of the uh, ace and arrow buds, and interestingly, I, I actually think that Kim, uh, that Barrier Gates is a uh, love letter to my uh, asexual and aromantic buds. Because there's kind of some controversy, a lot of gatekeeping from queer community about that being included. And I think Barry Gaze makes it pretty clear where Chuck stands on issues of gatekeeping. So I don't know. That's a pretty vague pitch, I would say. But um, Camp Damascus, I, I think it's kind of better to go in cold and let the mystery unfold. Sure. I did. You mentioned Jordan Peele, and I saw another interview where you said Get Out was almost a direct line to Camp Damascus happening because you realized 
how cathartic it could be. And if the movie hadn't ended the way it had, then, you know, maybe Camp Damascus never would have happened. Was there a similar eureka moment for Barrier Gaze? I've heard you take a lot of inspiration from movies. and uh, Yes, um, I think, yes, uh, Camp Damascus, you know, Jordan Peele, it's such, it, Get Out is so brilliant. And, and he is doing his own, you know, marginalized horror and and so i i do as well you know but i'm writing for the queer community um and so i think i had if you're in a marginalized group there is already a lot of horror and trauma flying around in the real world and i just kind of thought how do you make horror that is escapist and cathartic but also has has the tropes of horror has some brutality and all these things just how do you thread that needle and make something that is moving for a marginalized community? And then, you know, he really is such a genius with that. And so um, that helped me crack the code. I think that the that cracking the code for Bear Your Gaze was I had this idea for a long time. And then I watched a video about the barrier gaze phenomenon and I had already known about it, but I just kind of, there's a very specific event that happened involving the show Supernatural that got me very generally don't get that up that about barrier gaze things. I don't know why. I just, there isn't one of them in my history where I, where I really got that upset, but that one kind of uh, kind of got me, I say, and so I, that kind of was the catalyst where I thought, okay, I've had this idea for a long time. I have suddenly I have these really big feelings about barrier gaze, and you know, like I said specifically with that show, and then I thought. Well, it's more than just this show. There's all kinds of movies and stuff. I'm going to kind of create a story and take this idea in and kind of give these characters that I think have been mistreated. And this is why I say it's, this is why I say it's kind of a love letter to fandom. I think give them an, another chance with some of these characters that we uh, have felt uh, wronged for, for rooting for. And so I think the catharsis of it is drawn from that. So yeah, that's fantastic. I can't wait to read it now. I'm I'm trying to be mysterious because it's mm-hmm. there. There's so much. I will. I would say that that barrier gaze, as far as the big swings in art, for sure, the biggest swing I have taken artistically. I think that it is more autobiographical. A, a lot of buckers try to find out about my way under the mask, but it is very much about my own life as a creator. And so, and then conceptually to bring in these elements from fandom and different shows and stuff, I can't really think of anything. I am not aware of anything like it. So I, I think it'll be interesting when it really comes out and Buckaroos realize, oh, that's what this is about is going to be kind of a wild time. So I always have to kind of hold my tongue and think, well, I can't uh, can't spill too much. We're not going to be in the news for like uh, barrier gaze leaks happen on obscure library podcasts, gay library uh, podcasts. And well, not with that <laughs> attitude. Let's yeah, you're right. You know what? You know what? I will be trying harder. So tell me more about uh, the influences that went into barrier gaze. <laughs> Only if you're a coward. <laughs> You know what? Uh, I do need that confidence. <laughs> when you're, when, I guess you've already sort of answered this when you're talking about Barry, your gaze pulling from your life. But I mean, is there other, and you interview other people, but um, is there anything historically that you play with in, in queer history? Or is it, you're, is, are you really just pulling from your life and, um, and people with, you've with, met? With Barry, your gaze? With um, their Barry, your gaze or Camp Damascus or any, anything else you want to? Um, you know, with Barry, your gaze, I am pulling from Supernatural and pulling from Lost R.I.P. Mr. Friendly also known as Z who who died and then uh, in a flashback episode we learn was gay the whole time uh, interesting <laughs> way to treat a gay character that's, that's so barrier gays that he comes out <laughs> after he's dead um, mm-hmm. 
there's a, a show called The Hundred the, that that is you know there's there is a lot and and actually Buffy the you know a lot of Buckaroos are very excited because the main character is named Misha which has a relationship to Supernatural, but the there's three main characters, and the other one is Tara, which I think uh, Buffy fans will be aware of, and then um, and then Zeke is the last one, which is probably the most obscure, but that is actually a reference to Loft. So, yeah, it, it, there are different kind of uh, endpoints to media. There's references to my own media. I mean, there's, you know, Camp Damascus is in, kind of involved in Bear I think the, the uh, if you uh, here is one little thing I can say that I think is a fun little thing to let you know how meta barrier gaze is. I, when writing the book, I had to change a character's name uh, because it, it 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 is a real person, a real famous person, and and uh, the legal department had had some problems. Let's just say that the legal department was okay with it until they got the draft and realized what this person was doing, and then the and then the name change happened. But a lot of readers, when I mentioned, I tweeted about the legal department, and they said, "Oh wow, I wonder what parts had to change." And I thought this book is so meta that they'll know what parts had to change because when I had to change it, I had to go back in and add a whole new part of the book where the lead character has to change a character's name because the legal department <laughs> makes them change the name. <laughs> so readers will actually know what what name had to be changed because now it's in the book where I talk about the legal department. So That's it's, amazing. Uh, it's a pretty big swing of a book, is, is I guess what I'm saying. And it's, it's available for pre-order now already? Yes, yes. And... Um, yeah, well, this is all library thing, so you all, you all, know, you know, pre-orders, dang, they're important. Uh, I think that maybe then, like the video game industry has kind of given a bad name, but um, as far as publishing books, yes, if if you have heard this and you are interested, pre-orders are very, very important. Yeah, we'll make sure that people know, and we always want them to, because we have tons of people who who order. You know, or love to read and, and things like that. Although that's a stereotype I try to break down on this show as well. Like my job is to organize information, not necessarily sit there and, and read it all day. Yes. I'm a librarian, not a not a reader, oh, not a professional reader. Well, I get the a lot of our listeners have controls over budgets and acquisitions and can say, yes, I'm going to buy this book for my library and I'm going to buy a million God. copies like yes. we would for a James <laughs> Patterson novel. Yes. Put Chuck Tingle where you normally put the James Patterson novels. Yes. Please, <laughs> please order a million copies. Uh, <laughs> I think my publisher would be very happy to get that million book order. Yes. Yeah, I think you've oversold it, Jay. But nope. Okay, now with that attitude, uh, you know what? Again, <laughs> I'm being <laughs> shown. <laughs> Exactly. We um, have some feral I, listeners. <laughs> honestly, but but shockingly shy when I ask them, do you have any burning questions for Dr. Chuck Tingle? And they go, no, 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 no we're good. We're good. Uh, yes. It, you know, that, that that's okay. They're, they see the mask and they think there's a buckaroo who uh, doesn't want to be asked questions. When funny enough, I do love being asked questions, but um, I, I, I can understand that. Mm-hmm. I think uh, one person sent in a, a question that was about when you are writing your tinglers about the human personification of insert object or concept yeah. here. Like, obviously, of course, we love the you know pound in the butt by my library card. Yes, uh, or whatever the title was, right? Yes, yes. Um, but this person wanted to know, like, how do you come up with those? Like, do you have a dartboard that you throw oh, things at? Yes. Or do you just get inspired? Um, like, how so- do you come up with your, like, human version of insert thing here that's my phone and my notes and then when i'm trotting through the day something will happen and generally if i think oh that's really relatable that's kind of a feeling or an idea that everyone kind of encounters then i'll write it down i think oh that's an interesting thing to explore with a tingler i think when they resonate the most is when there's empathy where everyone kind of sees it and thinks Oh, that's a feeling that I've had, or that's that's kind of a thing that I've noticed, and uh, and you can't really just sit down and brainstorm. And then there's another type of tingler that's kind of just like uh, 
less topical. You know, sometimes something happens in the news and it's me synthesizing my feelings on it and then kind of expressing that the real book. And then, then the other kind is kind of just um, I'm building out the world. And generally that, if it's something that kind of seems like a, a strange combination of ideas, like a, a mummy race car, for instance. Mm-hmm. Um, Love that one. Which, which there is a tingler about a race car. You know, you think, well, why isn't it just about a race car? I think that it's in general, mummy. yeah, when I, when I do those combinations, it will generally have to do with kind of story I want to talk to what the theme is. And then I think, oh, that would be interesting. You know, there's a lot of lawyers in the tingle verse, a lot of big Bigfoot lawyers and stuff. And that's another when you add on kind of a thing. And generally that just has to do with, oh, if I have some feeling, I think the story is going to be best told if it's about this character who's maybe very objective and doesn't bend the rules and, and is strict. And I think, okay, well, that's going to be a lawyer character and then they're going to learn to kind of loosen up or something like that. Generally, it comes from whatever feel, feeling I'm trying to express. And then on the page, it ends up being a kind of absurdist in its own way, which is, Wonderful. It's kind of funny that all these very kind of logical things, when you extrapolate them and kind of don't have any fear or boundaries that it's going to seem too strange for Buckaroos, can really turn into these beautiful kind of absurdist things that I think are very powerful. Yeah, like like handsome rabbit that's a librarian. Well... I will tell you, if I had that idea, I, I could not because rabbits are living animals. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I can only do extinct animals. Uh, ah. Yes. Or Wait, are you telling me Bigfoot's extinct? Uh, well, <laughs> or cryptozoological. I oh, will say, thank God. I will say uh, if the big feet came out of the woods to reveal themselves... Um, I would have to take down all my uh, all my Bigfoot tinglers because then you you would enter a bestiality realm, which is mm. is uh, not there. Um, but a good example, actually, um, a couple of years ago, I wrote a Easter tingler, and it's about the Easter Bigfoot, uh, okay. not the Easter yeah. Bunny. So there you go. Mm. There you we go. support monster fuckers I, on this podcast. Yeah, Just, there you go. I I have also written Bigfoot erotica before. <laughs> oh, there you go. Incredible. There's, yeah, I'm very handsome. Yeah. I mean. It's it's yeah. kind of that one is just right for the picking. It's like big yeah. big feet. We all know what else is big. It's just like <laughs> it's, it's I, well, this was a lesbian big. Bigfoot. So. Oh, he, that's great. yeah. I wrote it for someone else in like a challenge, and I did a. a it was like a southern gothic horror story with like with skunk apes Mm -hmm. um lord of boys yeah Mm -hmm. i live in the pacific northwest so it's like sasquatch sticker on like every single car so like joking about like bigfoot like walking out of the woods i'm like that would just make people hear more feral for (laughs) for the concept of bigfoot than like yeah Uh, where in pacific northwest are you i'm kind of in the seattle area so oh okay okay i've trotted around there quite a bit uh chuck's manager is in uh, seattle Mm. so i I know all the places around boston just has ghosts we we don't (laughs) we don't have anything don't sell yourself short that's great yeah well i mean i have been to the cryptozoology museum a couple times i was gonna bring that up i was gonna ask if you've been because there's a very handsome painting of a bigfoot with very kissable lips he's he's really Really, he's really. I got a. I've got a photo of it. I'll send it to you after we're done recording. Old Chuck, old Chuck has also been to Portland, Maine. I, like I said, I trotted around. Yeah, I trotted around in my younger years. I think I. I have. Uh, Chuck has been to every state actually, other wow. than Alaska. I've never mm. trotted to Alaska. I got. I got to fix that. I think somebody had a juke. Some of the Juno bookstore there. Yeah, Alaskan Library Association, get on it. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. I've, I've been following your just, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to keep you as long as I possibly can without letting you go, but you can just tap out <laughs> at any point. But I have been following your Patreon and I saw your drawings that you've been doing. And I was wondering if you're, you're building something up to that or if it's just a daily sort of meditative thing or what's, what's going on with that project? So I, I do it to, I, I do timeline Tuesday where I draw a creature from a different timeline every Tuesday on, on my Patreon. I just like it. I think it's a really fun imagination exercise. Very meditative. I think eventually, you know, all that material is there. I thought that'd be kind of fun to put into a book. Um, but I am 
intentionally not thinking about it like that because I just want it to kind of be its own its own little thing. And that's important when you are creating to kind of have these little, you know, these things that aren't necessarily in the service of kind of the big project that you let your mind trot and trot out in other ways. I think that's very important, at least for me. Mm -hmm. I feel that way about this show a lot, that it has to be fun first. And anything that we create for, if we were to ever create a book from it or anything like that, or a a study resource, I don't know what you could do with this stuff. Catalog of cat sounds that would always, that would always just be incidental. The main thing is that we're just doing this and hanging out and having fun and meeting really cool people. Is there any final thing that you wanted to, to let listeners know about? Let's see. Well, first of all, I just want to say, you know, it is, we are on this timeline. We have a beginning, we have an end. We trot along it and we, we try to use our, our time and make our decisions as best we can. Each of those decisions kind of branches off and creates little timelines. And I do kind of try to stress that there's a lot of power in that. Even just taking a walk in the park or on, or putting money in a bud's meter who you'll never meet. Little things very much matter. And for the listeners and this audience of librarians, you know, I think that for anyone, it can be easy to forget how much you are doing by making these choices. But holy cow. The amount of power in these choices that you're making all the dang time, recommending books and things like that, unbelievable, unfathomable power to bend this timeline, to prove love is real, to add a little bit more creation and push back against the endless cosmic void. I just want to say thank you, first of all, for wielding that in the way that you do. And second of all, Just to always remember that if you ever feel like it doesn't matter, it really, really does. It really does for a buckaroo just kind of making a sandwich in the morning and choosing to prove love that way. But dang, if you're handing out books, holy cow, it matters so much. So um, thank you. You're going to make me cry. (laughs) Well, Chuck, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you for having me. This was a treat. It's been really nice. I, I appreciate it a lot. We hope your opinions about librarians are a little better uh, now after the Texas <laughs> thing. Oh, yes. We hope we, we've restored your faith. Oh no, no, I'm I'm a big uh, I'm a big librarian fan. So uh, yeah, so there you go. And also a fan of handsome library cards. Mm. Who is it? Yes, yes. I give yeah. me a sentient, living, handsome. Ripped library card any day of the week. Mm-hmm. Same. Yes. Yes. Amen. <laughs> and good night. <laughs>